네, 감사합니다. Yes, thank you so much. 저는 서울에서 I am missionary h y u n m i s a from Pyongyang Jail Church in Korea. I watch many of the YouTube videos from New York Evergreen Church, and I've seen many of your faces online. And now that I'm seeing you in real life, it almost feels like I know you and we've met before. And so it's good to see everyone. And so today's message title is The Unquenchable Fire of the Altar of Burnt Offering, which is the History of Redemption Book 9. And this year, Evergreen Church celebrates 40th anniversary. And in Seoul, our Pyongyang Church is celebrating 60 years. And so the founder of our church and the author of the History of Redemption series, Reverend Abraham Park, he first began his ministry as an evangelist in 1958. And after praying for three years, six months, and seven days at Mount Jiri, he started a church in a house in 1964. And so, This is a commemoration of those 60 years. And so I will be sharing many uh, pictures, and we also made a calendar that shows a lot of the history of Pyongyang Church. And so I just want to thank God for all of his grace. And so today's title is The Quenchable Fire of the Altar of Burnt Offering. And the Altar of Burnt Offering is the first holy object that you see when you enter the gate of the tabernacle. And so in Exodus 27, verse 1, it talks about the dimensions of the altar. It's five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high. And so it is... very large, because five cubits is about 2.28 meters. I'm not even that tall. And the height is high and very tall because it's on top of the altar of earth. So you can say that it's about three meters in total height. And The tabernacle is a place where sins are forgiven by offering sacrifices, but the altar of burnt offering is the place where the actual sacrifice is offered. So it's the instrument that most powerfully demonstrates the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross. So when you first walk in through the gate of the tabernacle, you feel the fire and the heat from the altar. So you feel with your whole body the intense heat that you have to first resolve your problem of sin in order to meet with God. However, when we look at today's main scripture reading, the command is to make sure that the fire keeps burning on the altar of burnt offering. And so it's emphasized three times, so it shows us how important this fire is to be kept burning. So today we're going to examine the fire on the altar of burnt offering. So first, it is the fire of the Lord. And in the Bible, fire appears with various meanings. It can show us God's presence. If we look in Exodus 19, 18, it says, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. So when God appears and when God is present, he descends in fire. So there are so many hymns and praise worship songs that contain that word fire. And then in Jeremiah 23:29 it says is not my word like fire so it can also express God's word. And the altar of burnt offering must be able to burn sacrifice at any time. That is why the fire must never go out. And so this is something that we need to be grateful for because This is showing us that we can come before God and repent at any time. And this is truly a message of love. And if we look at Hebrews 9.14, it says that Jesus himself became a sacrifice for us to cleanse us. And so the fire of the cross and the saving work of his word will never cease until the completion of redemptive history. And the first time the fire was lit 
in this altar was in the wilderness of Sinai. When they offered the sacrifice for the first time after building the tabernacle, and it was God who directly lit the altar. The people did not light it. It was God. That's why it's called the fire of the Lord. And so if we look in Leviticus chapter 9, verses 22 and 24, it says that after Aaron and his sons had their priesthood ordination ceremony, Aaron offered the first sacrifice. And then it says in verse 24, fire came out from before the Lord and the burnt offering and the fat on the altar were burned. So God was present and he accepted that sacrifice and he lit the fire of that burnt offering in that altar. So we need to make sure that that light never goes out. Additionally, this fire is used to burn incense on the incense altar in the tent of meeting. And so if you look at the vessels that are attached to the altar of burnt offering, there is a vessel for moving the fire. And that is the fire pan, which in Hebrew is machta. And this censer is filled with fire from the burnt offering altar, and it goes into the holy place to burn incense. And so in Leviticus 16, 12, it tells us that that fire pan goes from the altar of burnt offering into the holy place to burn incense. That's why taking care of this fire is so important. However, at the first sacrifice when God lit a fire, on that very same day, there was a different fire that was offered that ended with death. And that's in Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. It says that the sons of Aaron, who was the high priest, so his sons Nadab and Abihu, offered strange fire that God did not command. And so they did that, and they died instantly. And the word strange in Hebrew is zur, which means strange or foreign or unauthorized. The priests were supposed to understand the importance of this fire more than anybody else, and they were supposed to guard it. But instead, they offered strange fire. And it would have been nice if God just said, don't do that. But no, God rained down his judgment upon that moment. Why did this happen? And it's difficult for us to know for certain because it's not explained in detail in the Bible. But we can understand the situation by looking at the words that God spoke after the deaths of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10. And so when you look at Leviticus chapter 10 verses 8 through 11, it shows us what happened after his, his two sons died, Aaron's sons died. God told Aaron and his remaining sons not to mourn for Nadab and Abihu. And in verse 8, God speaks directly to Aaron. And he speaks this directly to Aaron, whereas he used to speak through Moses. And so just now, his two sons who became priests just died. So the first thing God says, if you look at verses 9, it says, do not drink wine or strong drink. Don't drink wine or strong drink and come into the holy place. So it says, when you come into the tent of meeting, we should not be drinking drink wine or strong drink so that you will not die. And in verse 10 it says, and so as to make a distinction between the holy and the profane and between the unclean and the clean. Meaning if they drink alcohol and they go in to the tents of meeting, they are not able to discern between the holy and the profane, between the unclean and the clean. 
So then we can deduce that Nadab and Abihu were judged because they burned a strange fire before God because their judgment was impaired after drinking. And Jewish literature also records that Nadab and Abihu drank alcohol. So they did not prepare this fire with fear of the Lord. So when we look at Leviticus 10, verse 3, the first words that God spoke through Moses after Nadab and Abihu died were, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all the people, I will be honored. When the priests who are supposed to protect the holiness and display the holiness of God, God will rain down his judgment upon them. So is this word only given to priests? No, because we ourselves, all of us here, are the priests. And earlier, I said that in the Bible, the fire represents the word. So in that case, it can be said that different fires refer to different teachings, words that are not given by God, but words made by humans and teachings that are mixed with human words. Looking at Isaiah 29, 13, it says that there are people who fear God with their lips, but whose hearts have turned away from God. So outwardly, they have a life of faith, but inwards, they don't get any closer to God. So they are only taught by the commandments of men. And Jesus quotes these words in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. He rebukes these people for rejecting the commandments of God in favor of human traditions. They pretended to have good faith, placing more importance on the words of men rather than the words of God. So they're using the words of man instead of the word of God, and pretend to have faith. And in Jesus' time, the people did not have a Bible. Even though now, all of us, we each have a Bible, and there are various translations. And you know, now that you know, it's a little bit heavy, we can all have the Bible in our phones so that we can digitally pull it up anytime we want to read it. But at that time, it, they didn't even have a time, it wasn't even a time where they had their own Bibles that they could hold and have. So they had no choice but to learn what the religious leaders were teaching. And so they had to believe what they were teaching. So even if these leaders were teaching a different doctrine, they didn't have a choice but to believe it and follow it. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 to 5, it talks about a different doctrine, saying that if we advocate a different doctrine and do not focus on the words of Jesus, our hearts will be corrupted. And then Galatians, verse 1, 7 and 9, it strongly warns that preaching a different gospel will result in a curse. So they are teaching a different gospel. So Apostle Paul's ministry was during the era of the early church. And it wasn't that long after Jesus resurrected and ascended. But why was he so wary of other gospels, different gospels being preached? That's because there were already cases of people being deceived with different gospels and wrong teachings by using the word for their own personal gain. 
So what they're doing is they're using the word and they're saying that this is what it's written here, but it's not, that's not the truth. So they used the word for their own personal gain and they were destroying souls. We must not distort the word according to our desires by taking other people's knowledge or our own interpretations and other stories from the world. We have to understand and have discernments. So the history of redemption can be said to be a battle between the fire of the Lord and other fires ever since the time of Adam until now. The challenge of other fires that corrupted the Father's word and created chaos at the altar has continued throughout church history. So we must never light another fire in our hearts. If there is another fire inside of me or in my home, I am bound to be cursed. We must keep the fire that we received from God, the fire of the Lord, and the fire of the word that he himself has lit without extinguishing it so that we can be victorious until the end. Secondly, we're going to look at the transmission of fire. The altar of burnt offering was first lit and received by God in the wilderness of Sinai in 1445 B.C., and then, until Solomon's temple was completed in 959 BC, the light never went out up until that time. And this is truly God's providence and God's sovereignty. And when Solomon offered sacrifices after completing the temple, when we look in 2 Chronicles 7, it records a bronze altar which Solomon had made, which was the new altar for his temple. And we can see that in this new altar, God, God's fire came down from heaven again to light it. So 2 Chronicles 7.1 says, When Solomon finished his dedication prayer, fire came down from heaven. So God's presence, his fire came down and lit it again in that time. And when God rekindles the fire of the covenant in every time period, we have to accept that fire and not let it go out. However, northern Israel could not protect the fire. They could not protect the altar. And so they were destroyed by Assyria in 722 BC. And southern Judah, they also were destroyed by Babylon in 586 BC. And they also could not protect the fire. But eventually, this fire was rekindled by the coming of Jesus. In Luke 12, verse 49, Jesus said, I have come to throw fire on the earth. If it would kindle, and how I wish it were already kindled. This is what Jesus said. So he's saying that he came to ignite the fire of the word and the gospel. So because Jesus completely offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross and completed that sacrifice, if we believe in Jesus and thoroughly repent of our sins, he will burn away all of our sins on this altar and make us new people. I hope that we believe this. And that's why Jesus said that he would baptize with fire. And so Jesus completed the work of redemption through the cross. And now the fire burned among the disciples through the Holy Spirit. So they were able to see that fire with their eyes. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it said that the Holy Spirit came like fire during the Pentecost. And so this was after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. All of the saints gathered together and the Holy Spirit rained down like fire. And it was the fire that started the church. 
the fire lit their hearts, it lit their spirits. And the greatest characteristic of this fire being ignited was that those who were hiding out of fear, they gained confidence and courage to say that I am a disciple of Jesus. But before that, they were all scared to say that they believed in Jesus and that they were a disciple. But now they were risking their lives to testify that Jesus is the Christ. And this was a time that if you testify that Jesus was the Christ, you would be captured and killed. The level of persecution from the Roman Empire at that time and there's a movie called Paul and if you watch that, there's a very scary scene where they would capture Christians and they hung them on the streets and they set them on fire and use them like street lights. It, that is the time that they lived in, that they had to risk their lives and that kind of persecution just to believe. And so in this picture, this is a cave that those believers in Turkey would hide out and live in. And so they would hide out in caves like this to hold services and to teach their children and to grow in their faith. And if, and I thought this to myself, looking at this, would I have been able to do that if I were them living at that time? So when I see this, they truly were men of whom the world was not worthy, as it's written in Hebrews 11. And so it is based on the prayers and dedication of these predecessors of faith that the fire gradually grew stronger. And when the early church suffered severe persecution, by God's grace, the fire burned even stronger. And in 313 AD, Emperor Constantine officially legalized Christianity. And the power of the Catholic Church diminished. Because they were more obedient to the words of the Pope than to the words of the Bible. And they would worship Mary. They would have statues of Mary. And I was wondering why they needed Mary. They, and I, what I found out was that they were so scared of Jesus because he would come back with judgment. And so they thought that maybe we can use Mary and Mary can help us when that judgment time comes. And the Catholic Church, to show off their power, they built beautiful grand cathedrals and they sold indulgences to cover the costs of these constructions. And it was even thought that if a descendant gave money for a deceased family member, the moment they hear the sound of money being put into the offering box, and so that box right there is the offering box. The moment that the coins were heard being placed in that box, the person who was in purgatory would be transferred directly to heaven. And so they were using these sort of ideas and spreading it thinking that this would help them. And the biggest reason why this happened was because they left the fire of the Lord and the word of the Bible. At the time, the Bible was only written in Latin and only the priests could read it. 
So ordinary saints just believed what the priests taught them, assuming that that was the word contained in the Bible. But after a thousand years of darkness in the Middle Ages, on October 31st, 1517, the Reformation finally began when Martin Luther in Germany posted the 95 Theses against the Catholic Church. So with the Reformed belief that people are saved only by faith in Jesus and not by works and that they must return only to the Bible, they destroyed numerous statues that were in the cathedral. Just like our church here, they became centered on the word. They were centered on the sermons for worship. And the Reformation did not end in a few years. It took over a hundred years. And it wasn't just by words. There were people who were burned at the stake. And there were various wars that occurred because of the Reformation. But it was through the remnants who walked the narrow path amidst tribulation that allowed the Reformation to com be completed. And the fire of the early church may have seen to be extinguished by the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, but God allowed the reformers to understand the word and give them faith and courage to rekindle it. And so it burns again. And so in 2017, we celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. And we also celebrated the 10th anniversary of the publication of the History of Redemption series. And so a team of ministers and staff went on a special coverage of the Reformation. And so I was actually one of those people and I was able to go up the stairs of the Lateran Cathedral in Rome which is where Martin Luther crawled up on his knees to pray, thinking that this act is what would forgive his sins. But he realized this was not the right way, and so he walked down afterwards. But many people still do that because the church, the Catholic church told them to go up on their knees to receive Forgiveness. So if the Reformation did not take place, you and I would have done this. So it makes us realize how important and essential the Reformation, this movement was. So the faith of the reformers who sacrificed their lives for the Reformation spread to all the world. And thus now we are able to practice our faith freely. And so this Protestantism or reformed faith is not a theory that was created by Martin Luther or John Calvin, but it is the original faith of Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and David. It is the faith that believes in the words that were given by God and keeps that original fire that he lit burning. But unfortunately, the European churches that were dedicated to this reform 500 years ago are almost all ruined. Many of these churches that used to be churches became bars. And one of these bars was called Frankenstein, but it used to be a church. And I'm sure that we, it's very similar here in America. But we are a Presbyterian church. And the founder of the Scottish Presbyterian Church is John Knox. And I received my doctorate at Knox Theological Seminary. And he and John Knox is a Protestant reformer from Scotland. And 
and he's the founder of the Scottish Presbyterian Church. And I visited the Holy Trinity Church where John Knox first preached. And he was so moved because we were all so young from Korea coming to visit because there weren't many young ministers and believers in the United Kingdom. He was so excited to show us everything, and he was showing us all the original uh, versions of the Bible, and he opened everything up so that we could see everything firsthand. And what we did was we gave him the Genesis genealogies book in English. So in a situation where many churches are failing to pass on the faith, you are here working hard to keep the fire of the word alive in the U.S. and to pass it on from the pastors to the saints. Everyone is working so diligently. And I'm so grateful because I get to witness this firsthand. I hope that this light never goes out and that a second religious reformation will occur worldwide. And the special coverage of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation actually started because Reverend Abraham Park received an honorary doctorate from the very prestigious Knox Theological Seminary in the US in 2012. Why did he receive this degree from Knox Theological Seminary? It's a school that inherits the theological ideas of the Scottish reformer John Knox. And so when they went to go visit and they shared the, the Genesis genealogies, they received so much grace from reading the Genesis genealogies that they had invited and wanted to give Reverend Abraham Park this, this honorary doctorate. And you can also see Reverend Ab uh, Andrew Par Pack in this picture. And so in this picture is Luther Whitlock, who is the president of Knox Theological Seminary. And he dedicated a copy of the New Geneva Bible to Reverend Park. During the Reformation, many people escaped to Geneva, Switzerland during the persecution. And so there were a group of people that wanted to translate the Bible into English so that they can share it with their children and with others. So people like John Calvin, John Knox, they translated the Bible into English. And so the Geneva Bible was republished in the late 1900s with the intention of inheriting the pure faith of the reformers. So when the new Geneva Bible first came out, this is how the English word of the Bible was spread. And so as they republished this in the late 1900s, the President Whitlock was the one who led this republishing, and he had world-class theologians who participated in the publishing, and they all signed this Bible for their work, and he kept this as a meaningful souvenir. So there is just one, and he gave this Bible to Reverend Abraham Park as a sign of respect. And watching this, I got goosebumps. And then so I thought to myself, did, did he just entrust the entire 500 years of Protestant history and work to Reverend Park? And so I thought about this a lot. So when I think about our mission and our duty, it is a great burden, but 
are Pyongyang Church and Evergreen Church. We are Presbyterian churches. And the core of the Presbyterian church is scripture has sole authority and God has absolute sovereignty. And the history of redemption series is what reveals this most clearly. Reverend Abraham Park hoped that the history of redemption series would once again serve as a driving force to reform the church. And in the preface of book five of the series, he writes, God has brought about a reformation in the church through the movement of the word. I dare to hope with all sincerity that the history of redemption series may contribute in some small way to the reformation of the church. It is also my earnest prayer that these books may be used as instruments in the ministry of the word, which will start a new wave in the history of Christianity. And when I go to pastoral academies or seminars, many pastors say the religious reformation took place in me first through the words of the History of Redemption series. Even foreign pastors say that. It's truly amazing. And even the president of Knox Theological Seminary, Dr. Warren Gage, said this. I believe that we who have received the word of redemptive history will become the true reforming force of this era who protect the upright faith. The living word, the fire of the Holy Spirit will fill us so that we can become the reformers of our time who strive for evangelism and missions. And God will allow us to bring about the second religious reformation through the word throughout the world. So I will wrap up today's message. If all of history from Adam until now is redemptive history, then the 500-year history of Protestantism and the 130-year history of the Korean church are all redemptive history. I believe that the work of Reverend Abraham Park, the 60 years of Pyongyang Church, and the 40 years of Evergreen Church are all part of redemptive history. In particular, this year, we celebrate the 17th anniversary of the History Redemption series, and we are preparing to publish book 12. And since the end of last year, our church motto has been to continue working without ceasing. No matter what adversity and tribulation we face, the work of God does not stop, and we must continue and fight the good fight. And so we believe that his work will continue and it must go forward. So we must be diligent in doing that work. And so this is what that motto represents. And we have this posted. And it is the history of redemption has been continued through the dedication of many saints who did not extinguish the fire that God gave them. In order not to extinguish the fire on the altar of burnt offering, you must transmit it. Sometimes the devil will blow out that fire, but sometimes you and I blow out that fire. We have to take care of this fire and make sure that we manage it. But by our greed and by our indifference, sometimes we don't even notice that that light is off. Then that light and that fire cannot be transmitted. So we need to also take care of our faith to make sure that our faith and our fire never goes out. And so I hope, and I know that this time that we, being here, listening to his word, is us taking care of our faith. And so I hope and pray that we're able to truly devote our save, ourselves and live a life of faith diligently in order to spread God's fire. And during the Olympics, the fire is always on. and especially Evergreen Church 
is very famous among many of her churches for being word-centered. And nowadays, you can see everything online on YouTube. And many people watch Evergreen Church and our dedication and all that we do here. And they use us as an example. And I believe that the very act of all of us studying the word is in itself spreading God's fire. And there can be many different ways to carry this fire of the word. How can we carry this fire to all the worlds? With our talents and our passion. Our edu- and in, so in various ways it can be. However, How can we do this better if we do this in prayer and ask God for a way? God will give us wisdom at the right time, and he will open the way, and he will send his people. So I believe that our church is an altar, a spiritual word that burns unquenchably with the original fire that God lit. From here, we must fulfill the mission of receiving this fire and carrying it diligently. May no other fire be mixed in, but in Christ alone and by scripture alone, may we become the messengers of the spiritual fire through the words of redemptive history that bring about true reformation in our time. And I pray this blessing upon you. Let us pray. Our living Father, this church that you love so much. I thank you so much for allowing me to meet them through your word. May we always be word-centered and may we always keep your word and may we live for your word through Reverend Pastor Andrew, Pastor Joshua, Evangelist Joyce, all the way down to the children. You've called each and every one of them and to light the fire, and to never let it go out, to transmit this fire. May this church be a church that's able to transmit it all the way through. And to our descendants, may this fire be transmitted so that it never is extinguished until the fulfillment of redemptive history is complete. And may each and every one of us become faithful workers. And at this time, we have prepared our offering. Please receive this offering. May you also receive not just our physical offering, but our spiritual offering of ourselves. We thank you and we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.